Oh, I'm feeling petty tonight. Move aside, Genie Bus. The Sacramento Kings are now the owners of the Los Angeles Lakers, and Anthony Davis got quite the view from the floor of his big brother, DeMontis Sabonis, who is now 10-0 against AD all time. Get your brooms out. The Kings have swept the Lakers, and you are listening to Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News and isn't just the world a better place after the Kings defeat the Los Angeles Lakers? And Laker fans, I know you're going to be in my comment section. I'm already reading you on social media. All these excuses talking about rings and all these things from the past to make you feel better about the fact that the Sacramento Kings not just swept the Lakers in their four-game regular season series. They've beaten the Lakers the last five straight times these two teams have played. They've beaten the Lakers eight out of the last nine times these two teams played. And, oh, it gets worse. They've beaten the Lakers 12 of the last 16 times these two teams have faced. So, sure, you can have your LeBron James-led asterisk bubble championship. Feel good about that all you want. Flash your ring that you don't have or the the $2 replica ring that you got somewhere in, in Los Angeles. Feel free. Have at it. But in reality, the LeBron James era of the, the, the Los Angeles Lakers, the Kings era in L.A. is nothing but the King losing to the Kings. So let that sink in, and I hope it stings a little bit. It was just the regular season. You're right. It is just the regular season. But I guarantee you, the Los Angeles Lakers, if, if they manage to make it to the postseason, to the actual playoffs, not just the play-in, by the way, I think the Sacramento Kings are one of the last teams that they want to face at this point. Why? Because like I said, the Kings own the Lakers right now. With this win, the Sacramento Kings are back into the playoff picture. They are sixth in the Western Conference. Of course, the margin between them and the Phoenix Suns is next to nothing. So they could drop right back to seventh tomorrow. It all depends on how the Suns fare against the Boston Celtics. We'll talk about that later on in the podcast. As for the Lakers, they're in ninth place, three games back now of Sacramento. So twice in a week, the Lakers have had an opportunity to bite at the Kings' heels and maybe uh, make up a little ground and have a chance to, to not only leapfrog the Kings in the standings, but really put themselves in the conversation to avoid the play-in tournament and get into the playoffs outright. Two chances in a week and both times has ended in complete failure for the Lakers. Really, incomplete domination in so many ways for the Sacramento Kings in these two games. And speaking of domination, speaking of ownership, we all know who's the big brother and who's the little brother in the DeMontis Sabonis and Anthony Davis relationship. 10-0 and all time. DeMontis Sabonis continues to dominate when he faces Anthony Davis, and I'm telling you, the biggest nightmare for AD was when Sabonis was traded, not just to the Western Conference, but traded to the Pacific Division so that Anthony Davis has to face Sabonis four times a year. Domas dominates Anthony Davis, and it's not just statistically. It's not just overall record. It's on the floor. Did you see what DeMontis Sabonis did against AD tonight? I mean, we can talk about one play in particular where Sabonis went right into the chest of AD who fell to the floor like he typically does, and Sabonis scored over the top of him and the entire Golden 1 center popped, including the Laker fans that were like, oh no, I mean, this is just a continuation of all we know when Anthony Davis plays DeMontis Sabonis. We can talk about that one play until I'm blue in the face if you want. I have no problem doing that. I've been watching that play on repeat. It's so much fun to watch, and I haven't checked ESPN yet. I haven't checked Sports Center yet. If they do not play that highlight tonight, 
they're protecting Anthony Davis for no reason. That play speaks to when Sabonis and Anthony Davis play each other because Domas knocks him to the floor. Domas has no problem being undersized compared to Anthony Davis. He's way stronger than Davis. He's way tougher than Davis, and he has no problem going through Davis. And no, he's not playing in, in, in any kind of illegal way. He's not a dirty basketball player. For God's sakes, reading some of the things that I've been seeing on Lakers Twitter tonight, this is the organization that had Shaquille O'Neal in his freaking prime. This is the organization that leaned heavily on the shoulders of the most dominant physical big man this game has ever seen. Really? It's Laker fans that are saying this? I get Warrior fans to some extent or other fan bases going, man, Demontis Sabonis is getting maybe a little too physical. And he does play physical. Absolutely he does. Hell, so many people who are complaining about the physicality that Demontis Sabonis plays with are the same people that are probably saying, man, the NBA is soft now and the NBA was so much better 15 years ago when the bad boy Pistons were going through everybody's chest and the, and the, the, the NBA was better when it was tougher. It's soft now. But then Demontis Sabonis runs over your favorite player or your favorite team and it's, oh, he throws too many shoulders. Oh, he's too strong. Oh, he's, he throws elbows. He's such a dirty basketball player. He uses the ball as a weapon. No, Demondis Sabonis is just tough. Demondis Sabonis has had to make up for not being the tallest center in the league for quite some time. There's a reason why we call him the ox here in Sacktown. It's because he's as strong as a bull. And he'll go through you. He'll fight through you. He'll play physical. He pays for it. Trust me, Demondis Sabonis gets hit in the face more than any other player in the league. He pays for it. But that's the way Demondis Sabonis plays. And if you can't hang with him, you better get the hell out of the paint. And at this point, Anthony Davis might want to consider getting out of the paint based off of what's been happening. Sabonis tonight, 17 points, 19 rebounds, 10 assists, 2 steals, 1 block. Anthony Davis tonight outscored Sabonis. Wee! 22 points, shot 38% from the field. 10 rebounds to Sabonis' 19. 3 assists to Sabonis' 10. 1 steal to Sabonis' 2. Oh, and Anthony Davis, who's the superior shot blocker compared to Sabonis. Sabonis is not a rim protector. Anthony Davis is. Both of them had one block shot. Oh, by the way, Sabonis' one block shot was on Anthony Davis after Anthony Davis completely botched an alley-oop from LeBron James. Oh, so much fun. All right. Also, 48th double-double for DeMondis Sabonis. By the way, he's closing in on Kevin Love's record of 53. But let's move on from Domas. I've said enough. Uh, I'm, I'm being enough of an arrogant you-know-what. Let's move on to Keon Ellis. 6-0 and now. As a starter, Keon Ellis getting the start tonight. Second straight game he started. Last night he started in place of Keegan Murray. Tonight he started in place of Kevin Herter, who was injured. This is a starting lineup that I and a lot of Sacramento Kings fans have been very interested in, have wanted to see for a while. Fox and Ellis as your two guards with Harrison Barnes at the three, Keegan Murray at the four, DeMondis Sabonis at the, uh, at the five, and it worked like a freaking charm. Ellis tonight, 14 points, five of eight shooting from the field, three of five from three-point range, three steals, one block, had eight deflections in 28 minutes. I don't have time to play for you what Mike Brown said about Keon Ellis's deflections. He said if you had eight deflections in 48 minutes, that's a phenomenal performance. Keon did it in 28 minutes. Eight minutes and eight of those deflections turned into three steals for Keon alone. I mean, he is so unbelievably active on the defensive end of the floor. D'Angelo Russell is the latest uh, to to visit Ellis Island, which has been the new coined phrase here in Sacramento for what Keon Ellis does to players. He's putting you on Ellis Island. Last night, Keon Ellis hold, held Damian freaking Lillard to 10 points. Tonight, D'Angelo Russell, who has been cooking as of late, cooking. And typically, in in his history against Sacramento, has cooked the Kings. We all remember when D'Angelo Russell was a member of the Brooklyn Nets, and he led the Nets on a massive comeback here in Sacramento not too long ago. D'Angelo Russell had six points tonight, shot two of nine from the field, and turned the ball over twice. That is the Ellis Island. That is the Keon Ellis effect. Last night, after the Kings defeated the Milwaukee Bucks, Kyle Madsen asked Mike Brown about the possibility of of Keon becoming a permanent starter for Sacramento. Mike essentially said no. He's not considering at this point in time. After another fantastic performance, I felt the need to kind of ask the question again. However, instead of just asking him straight up and expecting the same no answer, 
I decided to kind of put a little twist on it and kind of ask Mike what his thought process is, what goes into his reasoning for either keeping Keon out or what he needs to see to make that big decision to make Keon an everyday starter. Here's what Mike had to say about that. Mike, you talked about this a little bit last night, also a little bit pregame, so I apologize in advance, but the possibility of Keon working his way into a permanent starting role what goes into a significant decision like that? Is it longevity or, or consistency of doing it over a stretch of time? Is it something specific you're looking for from Keon or any player? Just what is the thought process that goes into making a significant move like that? Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot that goes into it. It comes down to feel, um, you know, Kevin uh, gives us a lot too. And, you know, does it make us better with Kevin or Keegan or HB uh, coming off the bench just to start Keon, I, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have that feel yet. You know, you can always bring Keon in the game early. You, Keon can still average 20, 25 minutes a game if need be. And so um, kind of like Malik, just get, you know, it can give us the luxury of, A, obviously finishing the way we want to finish, but playing different lineups based on the flow of the game because we might go out there and the flow of the game might be in our favor with whoever's starting. Okay, let's ride with that. Okay, they want to make a run or they want to do this. You know you got Malik, you got Keon, you got Davion coming off the bench, and it just adds to what uh, is already a very, very good bench. So I understand a lot of what Mike is saying there. I think Mike is starting to bring that stubbornness that he has with – not starting Malik Monk, and he's kind of sort of starting to apply it to Keon Ellis here a little bit. I understand what he's saying, right? If you can have a, a two-guard punch off the bench of Malik Monk and Keon, who can you, you can bring in like aces up your sleeve, who can come and immediately bring energy after your starters hopefully get off to a strong start, excellent. You can play, you can plug those players in basically with any lineup, and you know they're going to give you something good. Maybe even consistently add... Davion Mitchell to that mix too because Davion has been playing very well over the last month and some change for Sacramento here so there's three guards off the bench right now that Mike feels pretty good about playing at any point during the game and that they're going to provide production for him I understand that completely that being said and this is not an anti Kevin Herter thing or I do not intend it to be an anti Kevin Herter thing We've talked about it before. I think the writing is on the wall with Kevin Herter's future here in Sacramento. That doesn't mean that you let him waste away on the bench, right? That doesn't mean that he doesn't provide value for the Sacramento Kings right now. Of course, he absolutely does. And if you were to tell me at the beginning of this season that Keon, who came into this season in his second year as a two-way player after being an undrafted rookie last year, if you were to tell me, Matt... In March, you would be lobbying for Keon Ellis to be the full-time replacement for Kevin Herter in the starting lineup with the Kings in a playoff race with the expectation that they will be playing in the postseason. I would have told you you're insane, right? I never would have saw that coming. It's been an incredible journey for Keon. But at this point in time, it's hard to argue that starting Keon is not what's best for the Sacramento Kings at this point. Because it goes beyond just, like, obviously, if you start Keon Ellis every single day, I don't expect the Kings to go undefeated for the rest of the season. I'm not, I'm not foolish about that. I'm not, that's silly, right? Keon being 6-0 and as a starter is awesome. A lot of that has to do with how the Kings are playing, not just Keon is playing. But it, it's, I think it's a good representation of how impactful Keon has been for winning basketball for Sacramento. It's great. I don't expect the Kings to be undefeated if Mike were to make Keon an everyday starter. That being said, Keon's impact on both ends of the floor, to me, is, is undeniable at this point. Do I think Keon Ellis is as good of a shooter or a better three-point shooter than Kevin Herter is? No, I don't. That's an elite skill that Kevin Herter has, although Kevin's been struggling with it consistently this season. Keon right now is hitting a lot of threes. He looks fantastic. Tonight, Keon Ellis, 14 points, 5 of 8 from the field, 3 of 5 from three-point range, 3 steals, 1 block tonight. Like, excellent. He's making the impact offensively. He's hitting shots on the perimeter, shooting them with confidence, still providing that floor spacing that you get with Kevin Herter. And then on the defensive end, Kevin Herter's trying, Kevin Herter's battling, Kevin Herter is bigger and longer than Keon Ellis is. But it is undeniable when you watch Keon play when you versus when you watch Kevin Herter play. One is 
monumentally more impactful on the defense for Sacramento and setting the tone defensively than the other is. I really don't mean to make this a Keon versus uh, uh, Kevin thing, but if Keon's knocking on the door of a starting spot, and he's just not he's not just knocking on the door at this point. He's pounding on it. I think Keon is doing everything he can possibly do to make Mike make that a permanent change. He's done everything possible at this point in time outside of scoring 30. He's played his role, he's done his job, and he's done it about as good as you can ask from a player who, again, a couple months ago was on a two-way contract, or even less than a couple months ago. Right? Keon is doing his job. Kevin's spot is the spot that's open or that is the most vulnerable, right? Keon's a guard. Kevin's a guard. It's not hard to put two and two together. Keon Ellis should be under heavy consideration to be an everyday starter. But if Mike's not ready to go yet uh, or make that decision yet when Kevin comes back and, and is healthy, I guess I understand that to some extent. The only thing that is unacceptable for me at this point is Keon Ellis not playing. When Keon was playing well earlier in the season, suddenly Mike went away from him and went back to Davion. Now Mike has figured out a way to get Keon and Davion on the floor at the same time, and they're rewarding him. I hope that can carry out through the remainder of the season and into the postseason. I'm not saying Keon is going to be perfect for the remainder of this year or is going to be excellent for the remainder of the year. He's probably going to have bad games and struggles at time as well because every single player goes through it. But to me, Keon Ellis has more than earned a everyday rotational spot. He has. Like, the only thing unacceptable at this point for me, if Mike is going to continue to preach what he's preaching on the defensive end and trying to win by playing the way that the Kings have played over these last two games, Keon has to be a part of that. If he's sitting on the bench, you're just wasting him at that point. That's the only unacceptable thing that Mike can do with Keon for me at this point in time. I know you have thoughts on Keon Ellis. I know you have thoughts on DeMontis Sabonis versus Anthony Davis. Let him fly. Comment section if you're watching on YouTube. Hit me up on Twitter at Matt George Sack. You can email me at any time, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for, and with eBay's guarantee to fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back no questions asked because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not burning cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into the mvp and bring home that win keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers so in addition to all the fun we're having with DeMondis Sabonis and with Keon Ellis and, and the Kings beating the Los Angeles Lakers, if you take the Lakers part out of it and just look at these two games that the Kings have played over the last two nights, back-to-back really, really solid performances. The Kings held the Lakers tonight to 107 points. They win 120-107. to 107. Why is that number significant? Well, first and foremost, if the Kings held opponents to 107 points a night, they're in very, very, very good shape. Of course, They haven't been able to do that consistently. But Mike Brown pointed out something that I thought was fascinating before the game that I've never, ever considered. And I'm so glad that he has an amazing analytics department and amazing assistant coaches and stuff that can track this kind of stuff because bozos like me don't even recognize it. The Kings have held, including last night, when they defeated the Milwaukee Bucks and held the Bucks under 100 points. The Kings have held their opponents under 100 points six times this season. No surprise, in those six games, they're 6-0. But in the game after they've given up or held a team under 100 points, they've given up on average 116 points per game. So they have not been able to put together any kind of solid defensive streak or replicate their solid defense from one game to the very next one. That like hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, wow, I never even considered that. I never even realized that. Mike brought that up pregame and said that was a message to the Kings uh, players and the team before tonight's game started. Well, the Kings respond. They didn't hold the Lakers under 100 points, but they held the Lakers to 107. They held the Lakers to nine points less on average than they normally do the game after holding a team under 100. 
I thought, I mean, that's tremendous improvement right there. And De'Aaron Fox, I asked De'Aaron Fox about that. He talks about it and then also starts to talk about something that we're going to get into in just a little bit, which is the Kings playing with physicality on both sides, but especially on the defensive end, and how they're being officiated with that physicality. Fox, Mike shared with us pregame that I believe in games after holding opponents to under 100 points, you guys have been giving up like 116 per game yeah. or something like that. That message obviously stuck. Didn't hold them under 100, but 107, I believe. Like, what, what did that message mean to the team, and how do you feel that you built upon that? Oh, it's something that we had to concentrate on. I mean, like I said, we, our season lies what, what, in what we do defensively. And uh, if we're able to do that, obviously you're not going to you know, hold teams under 100 all the time or even in this league now, 110 all the time. But uh, if we can go out there, we can be physical. We can kind of dictate you know, their movement. Um, and I feel like games are being called a little differently. Uh, they say that they're not, but I think it's very obvious that they are. Uh, we can I mean, we can sit here and lie all we want, but um, you try to see, you know, how much how physical can you be without, you know, being being called for fouls. And uh, we're trying to find that happy median. I think these last two games, I think well, obviously yesterday they uh, shot 32 free throws, but um, I still think we did a good job with our physicality. And, I, and this night, 21 is not. Was 22 is not a, a, a bad mark, but um, with us being physical as, as we are, I think we're doing a great job trying to keep them off the line. Again, I want to talk about what De'Aaron said with that physicality and with the fouling here uh, in just a second. In addition to the back to uh, the back to back great performances, other aspects of that, the Kings dominated the second chance points battle 16 to four. They dominated the fast break battle 16 to six, 16 points to six fast break points for the Lakers. They converted 70 percent of their fast break opportunities, seven of ten uh, in, in transition, uh, and of course. The Kings did an excellent job shooting the basketball. They went 19 of 41 from three-point range tonight, 46%. So back-to-back, really solid, high-percentage three-point shooting nights. And the reason for that, pointed out by Mike Brown again, I spent a lot of time after the Bucks game talking about spray threes, paint touches and spray threes. Go back and listen to that portion again if you need to, or if you missed it, go back and listen to that because it was a major emphasis of Mike after the, uh, the Houston Rockets' loss. And it's been a major emphasis coming into these two games that the Kings have just played. Tonight, the Kings got 19 spray threes. 19 threes where the Kings touched the paint and sprayed it out to to an open shooter or a semi-open shooter, which is a pillar of Mike Brown's offense. The goal is 20 a night, but 19 is certainly better than the 11 that the Kings had been averaging uh, since the All-Star break, which has been a major problem that Mike has pointed out. Here's the big thing, though. In the 19 spray three opportunities that the Kings had, the 19 spray threes that they took tonight, they hit 11 of them. So they shot 57% on spray threes. No wonder they're shooting such a high percentage because the best looks that, in Mike Brown's opinion, the best looks that the Kings could possibly be generating from the perimeter, they are knocking down at that 57% clip. That's what makes this Kings shooting team so lethal. Those are very different shots than a pull-up three in transition or a dribble handoff three from from DeMonta Sabonis or even uh, taking a screen from Sabonis or screen from a big man. You're you're, uh, as like De'Aaron Fox or the point guard and your defender goes under the screen instead of over it, so you decide to pull up for that three. Those threes are fine. Mike's not saying that those threes are bad, but he wants to generate a lot of the three-point shots that the Kings are taking because, again, they took 41 of them tonight. He wants to generate a lot of those by touching the paint and spraying it out. The Kings did that for the second straight night. They shot well for the second straight night. They won for the second straight tonight. Night. So, hey, maybe Mike Brown knows a little bit about what he's talking about. But let's revisit what Fox was saying there a little bit in the clip. The Kings, for the second straight night, especially on the defensive end, played with physicality. And it made an impact, right? Really, really good physical effort for Sacramento defensively over these last two games, and they turned to get turned or put together two really good defensive performances against two very volatile offensive teams, very dangerous offensive teams. But they're not being officiated the way they want to be, right? They are paying the price for playing with physicality based off of how officials are are are, are, are calling games against them. The Lakers shot 22 free throws to the 12 Kings free throws tonight. 
Last night, the Bucks shot 35 free throws to 16 for Sacramento. So in these last two games, the Kings opponents have shot 57 free throws to Sacramento's 28. That is a massive discrepancy, right? Mike Brown, De'Aaron Fox, the Sacramento Kings don't feel like, I mean, they, they acknowledge that's a bad thing, but they don't feel like they're doing anything wrong to deserve that lopsided of a free throw total. Essentially what De'Aaron's saying there is they say they're not calling the game any differently, but because the Kings are playing with physicality on the defensive end, they're getting called for it when opponents are playing physical against them and have been all season long, which the Kings have struggled with, and the Kings haven't gotten the foul calls that they think that they deserve. So I'm not going to go too far down a rabbit hole of anti-officiating or anything like that. All I'm going to say is this. If the, if the short-term, and maybe hopefully not long-term, but at least for now, if the short-term trade-off is the Kings giving up a lot of free throw attempts, but they play with damn near a 48-minute effort of physicality on the defensive end and turn in the performances on that end of the floor, which also benefits the offense and leads to good opportunities offensively that they've done over these back-to-back games, I'll take that trade any day of the week. right? I absolutely will. One of these days, a team shooting that many more free throws than the Kings is going to really hurt Sacramento, especially in a close game. right? But for now, if that's the price you have to pay, sending a team to a line a lot, but overall... You're playing a solid defense. Look, it's the Lakers. The Lakers are going to get to the line a lot anyway because of LeBron James and Anthony Davis. So it is what it is, right? Don't sacrifice how you're playing defensively with that physicality. Don't sacrifice that because of free throw shooting. Continue to play that way until hopefully the officials expect it, get used to it, and maybe have a conversation with the officials before the game too of like, yo, we're, we're trying to play physical on the defensive end intentionally because we've been getting burned on that side of the floor not playing that way. Call what you think is a foul, but just so you know, we're going to play this way. And you don't have to whistle everything or you don't have to be surprised when we're going right into the chest of somebody or we're using our chest to try and stay in front of somebody, not just letting them blow right by us, which has kind of been King's basketball over the last two decades, right? I'm okay with the trade-off, absolutely. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. I am one of them. I'll be honest with you, a lot of Sacramento Kings media members are playing Prize Picks right now. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. So here's a little tip for you. In the future, when the Sacramento Kings and Los Angeles Lakers play, you'll probably have to wait until next season. Just take the over or or take more on DeMontis Sabonis points or rebounds or assists or combinations of the three and take less on Anthony Davis. More often than not, you're going to win. But you, you you pick two to six players. You pick more or less. You put how much uh, money that you're uh, that you're putting down. You can win up to ten times, or excuse me, up to twenty times, uh, twenty five times your uh, your entry just initially. But then they have these demons and goblins as well. The demon picks are a little more risk for bigger payouts. The goblin picks a little bit easier, so you can kind of mix and match a a few. Make sure you get a goblin pick or two in there to help you feel like you're going to secure four, five, or six correct picks, and then add a couple demons in there to really boost that value as well. There's so many fun, unique, and entertaining ways for you to play prize picks. If you're considering giving it a try, it's addicting. I'm warning you ahead of time, but addicting in the best way. Go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use code LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com com slash locked on NBA prize picks pick more pick less it's that easy locked on Kings is also brought to you by Robin Hood did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement you can still have an IRA Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you three percent boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robin Hood gold but get this now through April 30th Robin Hood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a three percent 
3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fle- fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of quarter 1, 2024, validated by Radius Global Marketing uh, Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SP, uh, SIPC is a registered broker dealer. So before we wrap up, let's talk about a few unsung heroes tonight. This first one does not deserve to be unsung. And once again, shame on me for waiting until the last segment to talk about him because I do it far too often. It's Mr. Harrison Barnes. The Black Falcon tonight was automatic from three-point range. Big shot after big shot, HB hit. He finished 23 points, 8 of 15 from the field, but 7 of 11 from three-point range. Also had a couple of rebounds and a couple of assists. Like I mentioned, he had some big shots, some big threes in the second half, particularly in the fourth quarter, that snuffed out really any attempt of a Laker run. And this is the second straight night where in addition to the Kings playing physical, in addition to the Kings uh, 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 shooting the ball well and getting their spray threes, doing everything that Mike Brown has, has been wanting them to do consistently. In addition to that, and I don't think this is a coincidence, Sacramento has been able to maintain double-digit leads and not allow teams to come roaring back, right? LeBron James and the Lakers tried to get going a little bit there uh, in, in the early fourth quarter after the Kings held them to, I think, 17 points in the third quarter. And the Lakers, or the Kings managed to, to snuff that out and ended up winning comfortably for the second straight night. An opposing head coach, Darvin Ham tonight, decided to wave the white flag pretty early and, and, and get his... Uh, actually, it wasn't that early compared to the like, like six minutes and 30 seconds left by the Bucks uh, last night. But eventually, Darvin Ham waved the white flag and, and got his reserves in there, including Harry Giles. It was good to see Harry Giles back. Um, so good to see Sacramento do that on back-to-back nights. Another unsung hero, Keegan Murray, comes back after missing last night's game uh, with the left ankle injury, drops 19 points, 7 of 13 from the field, 5 of 10 from three-point range, 11 rebounds, which is an awesome number for Keegan to get 11 boards. Mike is constantly constantly challenging Keegan to uh, be active on the glass. He provided that tonight. Also three assists and two steals. Davion Mitchell gets some love as an unsung hero as well. Mike Brown sang his praises in the post-game press conference talking about how Davion was unbelievable or, or excellent when it came to those spray threes. Like He really did an excellent job with that, so Mike gave him all the credit in the world, and we'll continue to give him that credit as well here on Locked on Kings. And then also, hey, shout out Alex Len, too, because Anthony Davis decided to try and get some minutes uh, and, and see if he could get going when DeMontis Sabonis was out of the game, and Alex Len didn't back down. Stole the ball from AD at one point, met LeBron James at the rim with a hard foul that could have been a block, but probably was a foul, but either way, he didn't back down and just let uh, 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 LeBron score at the rim like... Alex Len came in, he played physical, played hard, and, and managed to give DeMontis Sabonis that rest and not give Davis or anybody else any kind of momentum in the paint, which was great to see. So, the Kings are off now until Saturday. They had an unbelievably successful back-to-back here against the Bucks and the Lakers. Just a tremendous two-game stretch that hopefully the Kings can keep this momentum going. A couple days off. Then they have the New York Knicks here in Sacramento. Another team that plays hard, plays physical, has some guys that can give the Kings fits. So another opportunity at home for the Kings to really hopefully maintain their position in that sixth seed and maybe knock on the door of a fifth seed too. I don't think the New Orleans Pelicans are going anywhere. I think the fifth seed is is probably going to end up theirs, but they did lose tonight. Uh, I think the Cleveland Cavaliers beat them pretty good tonight. So shout out Cleveland, and maybe the Kings can try and make some noise and put some pressure on the the Pelicans. The Kings and the Pelicans do play one more time in a couple weeks before the season is over. Hopefully the Kings can make that game a little extra meaningful. That being said, in the meantime, what are we rooting for tomorrow? Well, we are rooting for the Celtics for over uh, the Suns tomorrow, so go Boston. We are rooting for the Chicago Bulls over the Clippers tomorrow, so go Bulls. And we're rooting for the Thunder over the Dallas Mavericks tomorrow, so go Thunder. The Mavericks did beat the Golden State Warriors tonight, knocking them or keeping them down in 10th. The Mavericks are still behind the Kings 
uh, in, I think, eighth now, now trying to catch the Suns in seventh. Uh, but hopefully the Celtics will do the Kings a solid and beat the Phoenix Suns so that the Suns don't leapfrog the Kings on a day where Sacramento is off. Maybe the Kings can get even a little bit more separation from the Suns with a loss tomorrow night. So that's really the main game and mainly what we're rooting for. The Kings have played really, really well against two uh, a championship contender in the in the Milwaukee Bucks, and then a a still playoff threat and good team in the Los Angeles Lakers. Hopefully, they can continue that against a a good team in the New York Knicks. But I don't blame you if you're getting a little nervous about the games after the Knicks game because after that they end their home stand against the Memphis Grizzlies, and then they go on the road and take on the Toronto Raptors and Washington Wizards. Two teams that aren't very good. Two teams in the East that aren't very good. Hopefully the Kings don't fall into their pattern of playing to the level of their competition and playing down and potentially losing those games. I'm not trying to speak that into existence. I just know this Kings team as well as you know this Kings team, so hopefully they can avoid that. But I appreciate your support here of the Lockdown Kings podcast. Even you Laker fans who are hate listening right now, I appreciate you, (laughs) I guess. Thank you for listening. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.